Hey, Shreya. Hey, Jason. Tell us about the work that you did with the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation and the film series called The Imaginary Friend Society. Yeah, well, working on behalf of the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation, uh, I helped create The Imaginary Friend Society, which was a series of animated short films that uh, explain pediatric cancer in a way that kids could understand. Um, these first ever films uh, were um, intended to talk about all facets of the pediatric cancer experience, including topics like MRIs, radiation, surgery, losing your memory, losing your hair, more emotional issues like feeling sad or feeling angry, and even existential ones like why me? Um, these films have helped ease the immense fear and anxiety that kids feel uh, that comes with a pediatric cancer diagnosis, and they've helped take some of that burden off of parents who have been forced to explain it to their kids. Uh, they've been adopted by hospitals worldwide. They've been translated into 12 different languages. And most importantly, they're gonna make a difference for generations to come. So that makes me wonder, what were your reasons for doing this? Well, these kids' struggles broke my heart and I wanted to do something to help uh, these kids and these families um, and do something meaningful for them. Uh, but I would be lying if, if I said that that was my, um, my only motivation. Uh, I actually, I, I also wanted the opportunity to do great creative work, uh, work that would bring acclaim to my agency, RPA, uh, to my team and to myself, work that would be so good that it would be uh, recognized by my peers and acknowledged by my industry. Um, I didn't necessarily broadcast my intentions to my colleagues, but come on, right after the films were produced, we spent months entering them into award shows with the hopes of getting top honors. It was pretty evident that, that everyone on my team was in this for a certain degree of self-promotion. Um, so on the one hand, I was leading this this, this huge effort that was having a profoundly positive effect on these kids and these families that were dealing with, with cancer. But on the other hand, I was being uh, partially motivated by my own self-interest. And I had a hard time reconciling those things. So what do you think motivates people to give or to give back? Well, I know this isn't the first time many people have heard this, but there are studies that suggest that pure altruism is a rare thing and that we're more likely to, to help others when it helps us. We're more likely to give to that college if it means our own kids have a better chance of getting in. Um, we'll donate to the neighborhood school if it means our property values might go up. Uh, we'll give to our temple or our church or our alma mater, not just out of the kindness of our hearts, but because we might enjoy some of those benefits firsthand. I know a lot of us uh, showcase our, our social good things we do on social media, I've done it. Uh, we're more likely to um, clean that beach or work that, that food bank or donate to hurricane relief or COVID relief or don a mustache during the month of November if it means that we can post our pious acts on social media for everyone to see. But giving not only looks good, it actually makes us feel good too. And in 2007, there was a study done around people's motives for voluntary donations. And in it, they talk about something called a warm glow that accompanies an individual's voluntary donation. And they call it that because of the visible glow in the region of the brain where the neurotransmitter dopamine is released when you give that results in a heightened sense of well-being. So in essence, giving makes the giver feel good and encourages them to want to give more, which as one researcher put, is like getting a personal kickback for doing good. But I think really what this boils down to is this idea of selfish giving, which is a term that's been used to describe this mutually beneficial generosity, where we give in order to make ourselves look good and in, more, in order to make ourselves feel good about ourselves. Is this something that you see where you work in the field of marketing? Yes, it is actually. Um, cause marketing uh, is, has become a huge way that companies market themselves. Um, cause marketing is essentially this unholy alliance between economy and charity, 
where companies uh, will promote their socially conscious acts and the things that they care about in order to align with the things their customers care about and thus increase loyalty and increase revenue. Uh, a few examples of this, YoPlay aligns themselves with the Susan G. Komen Foundation and comes out with a series of pink lids for their yogurts and every time you send one in, they donate money to the cause. Uh, Walmart um, uh, just donated $100 million to um, fund a center for racial equality uh, because they believe in Black Lives Matter and that's something that matters to their customers. Uh, and most recently, um, and sorry, and one of my clients, Honda, uh, actually donated a fleet of re-engineered Honda minivans um, so that hospitals could transport COVID patients uh, to and from the hospital more safely. Um, and cause marketing uh, has, has grown immensely over the last decade. Uh, in 2019, uh, spending was at um, over $2.2 billion. And it hasn't just become accepted by people, it's actually become expected. Uh, according to one study, 83% of uh, younger consumers actually uh, trust a company more if they're connected to a cause. And 89% um, of younger consumers will actually switch from one brand to another uh, if price and quality are equal, if that company is connected to a good cause. So have younger people become our moral compass of sorts? Well, this cause marketing connection to younger audiences is a, is a really interesting one because on the one hand, this is a group that believes and has demonstrated, uh, you know, they stand for social justice, uh, they stand for the disenfranchised and the vulnerable and believe that companies should put social good at the top of their to-do list. But on the other hand, uh, in a study that was done, adults between the ages of 18 to 25 actually admitted to being the most entitled and self-focused generation. And in a now famous Time Magazine article, uh, their tests, uh, their scores on empathy tests were sharply lower than those of other generations. So if you look at research like that, it suggests that this is a group that's, uh, that believes in doing the right thing, but in sharp contrast, believes in themselves first. Uh, and I think this fusion of purpose and self-focus um, is actually at the core of today's younger concerned citizen. Whether we like it or not, this moral duality to do the right thing for uh, the wrong reasons has become a legitimate and socially acceptable motivator. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, the new norm is doing the right thing for more questionable reasons. So take Giving Tuesday 2017. People gave $380 million to causes. And then right after they did it, over a million people went on to say, look what I did on social media. Um, and there was a study done by a uni uh, University of Chicago team where they discovered that it was more effective to go door to door selling lottery tickets uh, for a cause than it was to simply uh, go and ask for donations for that cause. So really, you know, this would hardly suggest a virtuous world of do-gooders. And I think in fact, the closer you look at charitable giving, the less charitable it appears to be. But there is a fascinating fact here, and that is, as givers have become more self-focused, giving has actually gone up, actually way up. Um, last year, volunteering reached a record high. 77 million people donated 6.9 billion um, hours, and they gave $410 billion to charity. Those are huge numbers that suggest, um, you know, that people are, are extremely charitable, even if they are focused on themselves. Yeah, that seems so contradictory. How is it that as generosity has gone up, selfishness has also gone up? Perhaps it's due to social media, which has given birth to tools that make it easier than ever to give, uh, make it easier than ever to show off our feats of goodness. And by that same token, make it easier than ever to judge people um, by their giving habits. Uh, or perhaps this behavior of um, selfish giving, which is uh, has become mainstream and um, 
those societal norms, the things that validate big brands throwing lots of money at um, causes, at cause marketing, uh, have actually resulted in an increase in giving. Or perhaps it's just a byproduct of us feeling guilty because we're all so self-focused. But I think the real thing here is, and the point of all this, is if giving makes us look good and makes us feel good and encourages us to want to give more, then who cares why we give? Why fight human nature when you could just lean into it, regardless of how distasteful it may seem? Why not use human nature for good? If it's mutually beneficial for giver and receiver, then let's not attach a moral clause to it. Let's just accept it for what it is. Um, and not, you know, add stigmatic labels like right or wrong or saint or sinner or moral or corrupt. Maybe it can be both and still be positive because while you can question the intentionality of the imaginary friend society work, the wash of good that it's had and impact that it's had with so many kids and families dealing with, with pediatric cancer, it makes it impossible to question. Last year, I spoke at an event uh, for the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation. Uh, and afterwards, um, a woman walked up to me and introduced me to her, her son, Sam. Sam was 10 years old. He'd been battling leukemia. And um, she took me aside, got a little choked up, and said, um, uh, she said, those films were so important to Sam. They were like radiation for Sam's sadness. Uh, they shrunk his tears and they gave him the will to fight. Um, and I've heard stories like that uh, from a lot of people uh, since these films uh, were launched. Um, so they, they're having a big impact. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so how do you explain how we can do so much good yet have these contradictory motivations for doing them? Well, one could argue that uh, we're still evolving as a species and our ethical understanding hasn't caught up with our transformative powers yet. Or maybe this is the evolution and those wily brands that are solving problems in the name of consumer loyalty and people that are championing causes for less than noble reasons are actually just ushering in a new phase of benevolence and altruism. And with all the big problems that need solving today and tomorrow, that synapse of great ideas that's going to spark change and save lives and improve communities and better the planet for generations to come may very well be born from or include the philosophy, what's in it for me? Um, I think it's time that we recognize that the most generous of efforts uh, can have a self-serving subtext. And so those, to those people who say, well, motive does matter, and that doing the right thing for the wrong reason isn't necessarily charity, I say, look at all the amazing things that selfish can do, right? It can help kids fighting cancer. It can help fund research, support communities and, and people who need help. It can do so much for the recipient and do something for the giver too. I think the power of selfish is undeniable and I think it's time that we acknowledge it for the transformative force that it is.